everybody, welcome to Board Online, Board Offline. Today we're bringing you a review of Mage Knight, the board game. I'll, I'll tell you right now, I like the game a lot. Um, but specifically, what makes this game, and actually this is part of what makes this game so difficult to uh, do a full rules video for, is the level of complexity in the rules. I mean, you can see right here, there are two rule books. Now this right here is immediately going to be a little bit of a barrier for some people. Uh, we have a game walkthrough, which is 20 pages basically, and then a rule book that is 20 pages. Now the walkthrough is, I think the walkthrough is very well written. A lot of people complain about the way the rules are done in this game. The walkthrough, however, is, is basically, it's gonna help you set up your first game, and because it's gonna have these tiles set out set up in a specific order and you can see during the game when you're playing you'll be setting out these tiles and they'll be connecting in specific ways uh, and they have symbols on here to show you the, the exact way that each tile will connect so there's little question when you're putting it out and this will obviously change every game it'll be random normally when you're playing however in the first uh, the first game that you play when you do the walkthrough, you're going to want to uh, follow the walkthrough preparation, which will have these tiles set out at the very bottom. I know you can't see it right here, but at the very bottom, there's a number on the tile, and you'll have it one, two, three, four, five, and so on for that first game. And so as the tiles are coming out in the walkthrough, and let me, let me find where it starts here. So... In the walkthrough, it'll have, say, when you reveal Tile 4. Uh, tile 4 will be the first time you come in contact with a Mage Tower. And it explains the rules for a Mage Tower and, and how you can interact with it and, and how you have to go about uh, conquering it if you want to use it the first time and all that sort of thing. And then when you get to uh, Tile 5, you run into a monastery for the first time. It explains the rules for the monastery. And so it goes through, and, and in this way, it's able to slowly introduce, you know, all these different things, such as a dungeon, and there's a mage tower, like we said, and then a keep. And it's able to explain all the ways that you interact with these different things. And, uh, for instance, in that might, with the monastery, could be the first time that you interact with artifacts. And so since that's the first time that you'll likely be interviewing, uh, interviewing, you're not going to interview an artifact. The, the, likely the first time you're going to be interacting with an artifact, uh, it ex that's when it explains how that goes. So the walkthrough, I feel, does a very good job of getting you into uh, the game and helping you get started with the game. However, I will say the walkthrough is not perfect. For instance, for whatever reason, uh, they decided that at the end of the walkthrough, which is the first time you come into contact with... Hold on. With a city, it's one of these cities. Um, they decided the goal of the of the walkthrough is to find the city, so you don't actually interact with it. And city combat is actually one of the more um, in depth sections of the actual rule book. So when you get done with the walkthrough, all the rules that you haven't covered yet, plus the ones that are also in the walkthrough. Everything is in here, but instead of being in that narrative format, it's more in this bullet point format. Um, and, and, and I will say, you can see right here, here's two pages, and two pages is six columns, and that's what, like size eight font. So even though it's 20 pages, it might be, because this rule book is 20 pages as well, and in the main rule book here, there are not, I mean, you can see if you flip through, there's very few very few uh, drawings. So that is definitely a bit of a barrier to entry for some people as far as learning. Um, however, so with city combat, when when you are finally dealing with cities, um, that is one of the more complex set of rules in here. I'm trying to find the exact spot. doesn't really matter. Um, Point is, it's not covered in the walkthrough. And I thought that certainly dealing with city combat should be in the walkthrough. I don't understand why they chose not to put it in here. Um, they also chose not to put player versus player combat in here, which to me, that's fine. Um, 
player versus player combat is a is this is in in here in a small set well it's not really a small section it's like three quarters of a page yeah here we go and no actually I guess it's a full page because it starts starts here and goes to here so it's about a full page in here three columns worth of of, of rules for player versus player combat and I've read over it and when my buddy that plays this with me whenever we whenever we, whenever I'm playing more than a solo game uh, we don't really do player versus player combat and I've read a lot of people actually kind of don't mess with player versus player combat and in fact I saw something I thought was interesting um, Paul Grogan who uh, is a huge Mage Knight fan he's the over on gaming rules he has that YouTube channel and he was instrumental in editing together the English rules for Mage Knight um, I saw he said that he actually does not play player versus player combat uh, and I believe he said he's never played it which I found very interesting however that being said the point of that is that player versus player is not really integral to enjoying this game which is why I don't mind that it's in the rule book and not in the game walkthrough however city assaults uh, assaulting the cities in this game that is integral to this game and that should have been in the walkthrough so the fact that it's not and the fact that after you go through the walkthrough then you do have to go through this to get to a basic uh to even get a basic understanding of city combat whereas almost everything else is in here that's a problem and all of that to say that the rules for mage knight while i feel are laid out fairly well for a game this size they lay out fairly well for a game as intense as this um they're they're not perfect they're not perfect and that i understand why the rules for this game can be such a barrier for some people to get into it all right let's talk about the minis real quick uh so we've we come the game comes with these four painted miniatures uh for the four mage knights in the base game uh you've got the elf this uh dragon guy uh some sort of kind of knight a warrior and this um kind of black magic female mage type character um now i will say i don't know why and you know and this is this is something that uh i personally it bothers me a little bit, but it, I mean, it is what it is. I'm hoping that we're kind of moving away from this being a common thing. But for whatever reason, the uh, female mage just says the best way to go into combat is wearing uh, underwear, and that's about it. So, I mean, I think that's basically lingerie she's wearing, but whatever. She's actually one. Of, she's actually a pretty uh, a badass character in the game, which I think helps offset the fact that they dress her like that. That's, you know, something just to keep in mind. The miniatures themselves, they are uh, pre-painted, obviously. Not super detailed. Um, I think, from what I understand, these are uh, some miniatures that were used by WizKids. I mean, for Mage Knight purposes. Um, I don't know if it was for their RPG or what exactly, but they were used by WizKids for other um, purposes other than this board game and then they use the same molds for the board game and that's fine I have no problem with that I know molds are very expensive to create brand new unique molds just for a game um, the the paint jobs are I think good enough for pre-painted I, I understand that you're not going to get super detailed I understand it's not going to get super detailed when you're doing pre-painted stuff and so I don't have a problem with the paint jobs on here uh, I think that it's nice to get something that you don't have to paint when you get it. I enjoy painting, but I'm, I'm no pro, and so it's nice sometimes to have stuff already painted. The cities, on the other hand, are very, very boring looking. I mean, all four cities have the exact same mold, and the only difference is, here's the white city, so it has white tips on the spire and a little bit of white around the base here. Here's the red city, so it has red tips on the spires, a little bit of red around the base. You know, blue and green, same thing. All right, so the, the molds for the cities themselves are very boring and blah and, you know, whatever. Um, my real problem, however, is... Oh, by the way, if you weren't sure that this was the Red City, it says Red City right there. And, I mean, I guess that's good. Now, you know, I, I joke about that, but 
they, that for colorblind players, that's actually a really good thing. So since they weren't going to make the cities actually varied in how they look, I guess that's good that they had that on. I just haven't noticed that before. It actually said in Blue City there. I guess that's good. It, it does help with colorblind players since they've chosen to keep all the molds of the cities exactly the same. So that that's good. Uh, here's the, the issue I have, though, with the cities is... So when you're... Uh, let's say it's a level seven city. You would turn this dial like this. It has a little, I think hero clicks is the thing they, they use. You turn this to seven if you're going up against a level seven city. And then down inside here, it has a bunch of circles, uh, different colors. And what those circles correspond to is the type of enemies you're going to be fighting here. So for instance, this is white, two browns, and a purple. Oh. See, even now I'm not 100% sure. No, okay. It, uh, I, this is not me doing this for the video. Uh, it's actually a white, two browns, and a gray, I believe. Yeah. And the only reason I know that is because I just compared it to... I found on the Blue City a spot where gray and purple are next to each other, and I was able to then tell the difference between the two. There are color issues in these things. Um... So, but with this, so what you would do is that would mean that I was going to fight, I would draw a random white enemy, a random purple, uh, oh, I'm see, I'm doing it again, a random gray enemy, and then two brown enemies. And that's what I would fight in the city. Gray and purple are very difficult to tell apart on here. And the only way that I could tell for sure usually is when I grab a one right here where on level four for the blue city, you're fighting a white, a purple, and a gray. And I look at purple and gray next to each other, then I can tell. And it, Every time. And so actually there's people online that now have created these uh, little cards you can print out to slip into the back of the city cards, which I don't have the city cards in here. But if uh, you have the city cards sleeved, or I do have them in here, I just can't find them at the moment. Maybe they're in here. But if you have the city cards sleeved, then what you can do is you can slip these cards you print out behind them that have in much clearer reference as far yeah here we go so this is the city card and then you would just slip it right here in the back of the sleeve and it is much more clear about what color enemies you're going to be fighting because this is a common issue people find with the dials inside of these cities and while we're on the topic of colors these uh mana tokens right here now while these are really cool looking uh, I, and I, I like the way they look. I like the molds. Just don't, for the love of God, don't step on them. Holy crap. These are very sharp. They hurt a lot. While I like the way they look, they're, their color and under these lights that I use for filming is not so bad. The, the blue and the black are very easy to tell right here. However, with, when I was using just the light on my fan, um, you know, my, like a normal light, anybody would have normal room lighting. It was very difficult initially to tell the difference between blue and black. Um, and I actually have gotten to the point where I, when I'm playing this game, if I can't get really good sunlight into the room to really brighten it up, I'll turn on these lights that I use for recording just so that I can make sure I can tell the difference between blue and black. And it, it, because the, the colors for whatever reason are just very dull. And, and from what I understand, the first print run of this, it was not a problem. Um, but it is a problem with this one. So that's that's the other thing, the other complaint I have as far as components go. So the two complaints about components, the colors inside of here and the colors on here. Uh, also something I've read is a lot of people complain about um, have missing items from in here. And the thing is, the game comes pre-punched. Like it, these tokens come inside this already. You, you don't punch anything when you get this game. So I don't know if there's a problem with the the, the way that WizKids is doing that, where they're pre-punching everything, and because of that, components are getting mixed up and messed up. I fortunately did not run into that, with the exception of one of the, and I believe it was for, yeah, Noroas was missing one of his command tokens, and whereas I had a duplicate command token for uh, this guy, I can't remember, Tovac. 
for Tovac. I had a duplicate command token for Tovac for 9 to 10. So, and that was the exact one that NoroOS was missing. So I just moved that over. But I mean, it's a little bit obnoxious that I have Tovac's symbol on the back of one of Nor NoroOS's um, command tokens. But at least I had a replacement. Some people are saying that, you know, that doesn't happen. Now, I have also heard that WizKids generally is good about fixing the issue if you run into something like that. And, and I've heard that while it's a little bit of an annoyance in the base game, it's actually significantly more of a problem in some of the expansions. But we're not here to talk about expansions, we're just talking about the base game. So, one of the things about the components that I like a lot are these dice. I, I don't know, I like, I like tiny dice sometimes. And these are cool, I love the symbols on them. These are the, used solely for mana purposes, and occasionally you'll roll it for reward as well. These are really cool. I like them a lot. I'm a big fan of them. Um, and, and I think the mechanic is very neat as well, uh, the mechanism. When you're rolling during the day, and you know if you get a nighttime mana, which the, the black mana can only be used at night, then that die is locked and moves off to the side. Unless you have some cards that help you, you know, roll it again, then that's... Your, your mana um, pool, the mana source, slowly dwindles as the day drags on. Same thing at night. You know, you roll a gold one, your mana source uh, becomes locked, or that particular die, the mana source becomes locked if you roll a, a gold to or a gold um, mana during the nighttime. And I think that's a really cool mechanism that would be, and I guess there they, you do see that in other games and just themed in different ways. But it really works in this game, and I like that a lot. While we're on the subject of day and night, another cool, very thematic thing is that during the daytime, the forest is easier to move through and the desert is harder to move through, whereas at nighttime, the forest is more difficult to move through and the desert is easier to move through. The fact that they took the time, that, that uh, Vlaja took the time to think of that level of detail thematically helps me really appreciate this game for what it is um let's see what are some other things wound cards okay wound cards oh my gosh these are so obnoxious in such a good way i mean in terms of you're playing the game and if you you're really thinking about is it worth going up against these guys you know these particular set of monsters um, and you're thinking of it in terms of the number of wound cards you're going to get because they clog up your hand so bad. In terms of deck building, this is the worst. I mean, you get them in your hand, and then they take up you know your total hand limit, and you're just trying to think, how in the world can I get rid of these? Uh, so now I've got to go out of my way on the map. I got to go find you know there's there's certain spots on the map you can go to that will automatically heal you at the end of your turn. Um, or you can go and pay to get healed, and you know, pay influence, which is the main currency in the game. Influence is, and uh, you know, and, and or or if you are playing as, um, well, I'm sorry, I forgot her name, Erethea, which I'm probably butchering or mispronouncing that name, but Erethea playing as her, she actually works really well with the wound cards. She has a really. Uh, a, a, a lot of her abilities are central around using those wounds to your advantage. Um, and actually, Tovac has one too where you can discard a wound and draw a new card. But either way, these wound cards, its a, you really you think twice before you decide that taking a wound is the right course of action because of how difficult... Oh, and with the... There's a couple of enemies that have the poison ability, and that ability is a really nasty one because... When they, if you get wounded by a character that has poison, one wound card goes in your hand like normal and it starts clogging up your hand, but then another wound card goes into your discard pile. And what that means is that, thematically speaking, <clears throat> what's happening there is you are kind of scarred from this experience with poison, and in the future, you're going to feel some ramifications from having been poisoned, uh, because unlike most deck builders, and this, I, you can't really call this game a deck builder, but it does have deck building in it. And unlike most deck building games, 
where you're constantly shuffling through, you know, you, you go through your deck, you know, a dozen times in a game or whatever, or two dozen times. In this game, you go through your deck once per round. So you put that wound card in your discard pile, and it won't be till next round that it pops back up to bite you. But when it does, you know, it's just as obnoxious because you're trying to draw these cards and you draw wound cards and now they're stuck in your hand because you can't get rid of wound cards without healing or some sort of special effect. Oh my goodness. Um, they're just terrible. Terrible in such a good way. Uh, let's see what else we've got going. Oh, you know what? Let's talk about... Let's talk about these, all the creatures that you can hire. So you have two different, you have the, the basic creatures and the elite creatures. And I say creatures, there's also humans in here and, and catapults and things like that. And there are some really cool, oh, you know what I like in here also is that many of these guys, so you know, like say the fire mages are also enemies that you'll fight or like here we go here we go we've got ice golems as bad guys right that you have to fight but then also i exact same ice golem as a uh, a guy you can hire and that works thematically with the game as well because you are these outsiders in the game coming in to try to conquer this land that has been deemed uh, and and i can't remember exactly what the intro tells you but basically you've been sent in to conquer this land because it's been deemed needing of conquering basically and you have this reputation track here and based on how much conquering you do against fortified sites that the the villagers and and the, the citizens of this country kind of look at as sources of stability when you conquer those you lose reputation or when you conquer rampaging enemies that are tearing up the countryside, you gain reputation. So these guys are going to be protecting, for instance, uh, a lot of times Mage Towers is where you're going to run into the Ice Golems. And the Mage Tower is one of the fortified sites that, generally speaking, the, the people, the citizens of this, of this nation or whatever it is that you're conquering, they look at the Mage Towers as sources of stability. And so you're going to have these guys in there protecting it. But at the same time... Once you've conquered a mage tower and, and you've subjugated it, and now it's under your control, uh, you have ice golems that can be recruited at the mage tower because maybe you've won them over and now that you have control and they see you're not such a bad guy after all, they're willing to work for you a little bit. Uh, and you've got things in here like uh, peasants that can only be recruited in villages, which makes sense. And then you've got monks that can only be recruited at monasteries. Um, what else we have here? We have crossbowmen who can be found at villages or keeps. And it's just, if, if there's one word to describe this game, it's thematic. There's, the complication in the rules is because they wanted to, or they, Vlaja wanted to make this game as thematic as possible. He just, when he he filled it up with theme, and when he when it looked like there was no more room for theme, he knocked out the walls and filled it with more theme. I mean, that's basically what it feels like with this game. Um, try, you know, and we haven't even talked about the spells. I mean, let's let's go into this real quick. Oh, and real quick before we move on from the the creatures, when you fight these bad guys. When, when these monsters that you go up against, almost all the time when you turn them over and you look and you see what this thing is, and you're like, oh my gosh, this this ice golem has ice resistance and physical resistance, and it's got paralysis. How, what in the, you know, like it's just, you feel like the battle is against you. The, the upper hand belongs to the enemy most of the time. But as you start recruiting some of these guys, if you get a hold of some of these more powerful guys, you know, you recruit the ice golems or you recruit an ice mage or a fire golem or an ultim guardsman. You start to feel like, okay, you know what? I've kind of got this now. I, I, I'm starting to get the upper hand here. Uh, but that, And that's counteracted, though, also by the fact that once you use a, a guy that you've recruited, they can't be used again for that round. you got to wait till 
you get to the next round to use them unless you know you find a way to refresh them and i like that a lot that you have to really be strategic about when you can't just go into every you can't just go marching across the countryside and all in one round just start you know trashing everybody because your guys are not as resilient as you are as a mage knight so you you have to keep in mind what when to use them and and that's pretty cool too so then you've got let's see what hold on that's okay so you've got these uh, abilities these advanced actions that you will add because you start off the game with you know your basic set of actions that are exactly the same for each mage knight except for one card is different for each mage knight that is kind of specific to their style of play and then you start getting more uh advanced actions as you level up along this track and you know you can see you, it only takes three experience or fame they call it in this game to level up for the first one and as you go along you'll either gain the ability to uh command more troops which also gives you better armor and higher hand limit or you're going to gain an advanced action and a skill and as you gain these advanced actions they really start to uh, develop your character as far as what he's going to be able to do during the game. And it ranges from things like gaining extra mana and ranged attack to better movement. And the, even these are just so full of themes. So Frost Bridge right here. It gives you additional movement and it also reduces the cost of swamps uh, for that particular turn. Because the idea is you're freezing the swamp and you can then just walk across it. And then if you really charge it up, because every advanced action has a basic version and an event or a uh, charged up version if you charge it up with mana then not only can you the swamps become able to be moved across more easily but then also for uh, lakes you can move across them as well and so again just theme 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 um, <laughs> you could take a refreshing walk where you can move a couple of spots and heal so that's you know just some great stuff the artwork in here oh the artwork for the most part fantastic i like it a lot however there are a couple of instances where it feels like they got a little bit lazy and i'm going to show you right here real quick what i'm talking about so the bait this basic action right here is in every deck it's in you know all four of the starting decks. It's called Threaten, and you can see what it looks like right there as far as the artwork goes. Now, there's an advanced action that is similar to Threaten, but it's, it's kind of more powerful, and it's called Intimidate. Look at the artwork for that. It's basically the exact same artwork, but reversed and then zoomed in on. And I felt like there, there's a couple of cards in here that are like that, and that just seemed a little bit lazy to me. I don't know why you would go through all the trouble of getting unique artwork for almost everything, and then there's a couple that are like that. Let me find the other one I could think of right offhand, and I'll show you as well. So, again, the action that everyone's got in their starting deck is March. It's a movement card. Uh, and then this advanced action, Pathfinding, and this one... They didn't even reverse it. It's simply zoomed in on. You can see the two right there. And so I just don't understand why they, because mostly there is unique artwork for everything in this game. And then for just a couple of them, just a couple of cards. And I, I feel like there's one more in here and I can't remember exactly which one it is offhand. Oh, yes, here we go. So I believe... I, I know of three total that do this, and I'll show you this other one right now. And this one, I don't mind quite so much because at least they did something different with the artwork. Um, they, they added something to it. Uh, so you got Tranquility, which is a healing one, and then you've got Regeneration for the advanced action, and you can see that they actually... Because again, these this is like a charged up version of this one, right? It's a more powerful version of this. So I this one actually I like that they you know use the same artwork, but then made it look like it's more powerful. Whereas the other two, they just zoomed in on it. So ah, small small gripe, small gripe. Okay, Oop, that goes there and there. Okay, wow, there's just so much with this game. What else? What else can I say? I, I feel like 
I've, I've kind of given you an idea of most of my my few problems that I have with this game, and and really it's it's a it's a puzzle of a game is basically what this is, and you need to when you're playing and you're you're working through your hand. There's so many ways to use each card, so many ways, and you have to look and, and you have to think on the board. And if you want to get a good example of what I'm talking about, go. You have to go watch the gameplay. Uh, and please do watch the gameplay if you want to. But go to the gameplay video and look at one of the most recent comments uh, by a guy named Ultim or something like that. And he's uh, showing how using the exact same cards that I had in the video, uh, a more efficient way of using them and that could have uh, been much more beneficial to me. And that's what's great about this game is two people have the same hand of cards and are able to figure out different things to do. And, and I, it is definitely one way would be better than the other. There's no doubt about that. So as you play the game, you start to learn more and more how to better and more efficiently use your cards. And that's the key to this whole game is learning how to be as efficient with your cards as possible. And I love that. It is definitely has a very puzzly feel. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's a great thing. I think that's what makes this game what it is, is that as you're playing, you are piecing together this puzzle and figuring out the best way to go about and, and fight these guys while trying to get as few wounds as possible. Um, player count, it is a great game with one player. I've played it mainly with one player. It's a great game with two players. Uh, with two players, our games last between two and three hours. I don't think I will ever play it with more than two players because this is not a game, there, there's not really anything going on for you when it's not your turn. And so with two players, it already feels like a lot of downtime. And you get to three players, and I really think it would almost be like I could get up from the table and go do something and come back just before my turn type thing um, or, or during the player before me's turn. Because you, you do want to use the other player's turn to plan out your move a little bit, but you don't need two players worth of turns to figure out your move necessarily. So with three players and definitely four players, I feel like it would be too much downtime. Two players is just about right, and one player is fantastic as well. Guys, there's just so much in this game, and I haven't even talked about artifacts yet. Oh my gosh. Spells and artifacts are powerful and amazing. Uh, expensive as well, but worth it if you can pull them off. Oh, oh, one cool thing about spells. I'll just do one. Yeah, tell you one cool thing about both. Spells have this basic effect. That can, that can be used anytime, anytime. Uh, and then they have this more powerful effect that can only be used at night because night time is when spells are at their most powerful in this world. So that's kind of cool. With artifacts, they have this basic effect that you can use anytime you've got the artifact. They have this more powerful effect that consumes the artifact to use it. So you get a pretty awesome effect but it destroys the artifact, so you really have to decide if that is worth it. Because artifacts are worth points at the end of the game, but maybe consuming that artifact and getting that more powerful effect is worth it. So, Mage Knight the board game, I'm giving it a 90.8%, and that puts it in the top tier of games that I've reviewed. I love playing this game. Uh, man, I think I've played it about 13 times in the first couple of months that I, that I had it, and I've only had it for, what, three or four months now? Something like that. So if you don't mind complexity in games, if you th want highly thematic games, if you like a little bit of a puzzly feel with trying to figure out the best way to play your cards and the best way to battle enemies, this game is probably for you. If you, if you don't want something that where you got to go back and reference the rule book on more on frequent occasions for the first six times you play the game this game's not going to be for you but but if you don't mind that if you are willing to put in the effort to learn the game it is a highly rewarding game and i highly recommend it uh, just just know what you're getting into and know that you probably don't want to play it with more than two people 
because of the length of time involved. But maybe, maybe you don't mind that. If you don't mind that kind of downtime, go for it. Go for three or four players. Uh, I recommend it with two or less. So anyway, 90.8% made tonight the board game. Check it out. De- you know what? If you have an opportunity to play this game without buying it, even if you're on the fence or, or maybe you're a little bit on the other side of the fence, and you're like, nah, again, not, at least give it a shot one time if you have a chance in your lifetime. It is quite an experience. So that's our review of Mage Knight, the board game. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up. If you like my channel, please subscribe. If uh, you want to give me a shout, look me up on Twitter, at Board Offline. I'm also on Board Game Geek. We've got a guild over there that has a whopping 12 members right now. So by all means, go over there and check it out. You can be one of the original founding 20 members. Why 20 members? Yeah, I don't know. This is, seems like a good number for to call people founders. I don't know. So until next time, if you're Board Online, Board Offline.